So today for our final featured reading of this month's Poetry Month reading series, we have Dr. Vince Grotera. Uh, Vince is a professor of English at the University of Northern Iowa. He is formerly the editor of Starline, the official magazine of the Science Fiction Poetry Association, and formerly the editor of North American Review, the oldest literary magazine in the country. Um, he is also the, he's been, sorry, he's also the author of four poetry collections, including Dragonfly, Ghost Wars, Flying Kite, and most recently, The Coolest Month, which is a 2019 release from the local press, Final Thursday Press. Um, and he will be selling copies of that today, as well as reading from it and some other, some other poems. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Vitz Cotera. Thanks, Seth. Very nice. Do you guys want to move up or? I'm kind of far away. There we go. That's good. Okay. You're blocking somebody there, Seth. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, uh, I am going to read from, uh, from this book, uh, The Coolest Month, which is a play on uh, T.S. Eliot's famous phrase that April is the cruelest month. I guess that's a sentence. But <laughs> April is the cruelest month from this poem, uh, Wasteland. And, um, and I just think it is the coolest month because uh, April is a national Poetry Month, and I take part in uh, a couple of uh, projects, programs where uh, people write a poem a day. And this goes on actually internationally, mostly nationally, but internationally. Um, and so this book is made up of poems from, from that project, from different Aprils in uh, the last, well, this is the 11th year that I've been doing this, writing a poem every day in April. I once tried to go past April and, and, uh, and I got into about the 5th of May and got tired. <laughs> All right. So I follow um, two uh, places uh, that, that provide prompts. One is called Napo Rimo, which is National Poetry Writing Month, naporimo.net. And the other is a blog that uh, is now called Write Better Poetry, sponsored by Writer's Digest that is, uh, um, uh, that, that blog is uh, written by Robert Lee Brewer, who's the editor, the poetry editor of, uh, of Writer's Digest, which is a trade magazine. And uh, the Napo Rimo is run by, uh, by Maureen Thorson. Okay, so I've been following their prompts. And usually what I do is I'll take the two prompts for, from that day and, uh, and try to use both of them in one poem. All right. I'll read the first one. These, these uh, poems are, uh, you probably can't see from there, but it says it has the date up here, April 1st. And so this poem was actually written on April 1st sometime in the last 10 years. Um, you know, and all of them have, all of them have dates and that's the day that they were, they were written. All right, April 1st. This is called, April is the cruelest month. We're hoping 30 new poems will arrive. And the prompt for that day, uh, prompts came from, that was in 2013. Uh, Brewer uh, asked for an arrival poem and uh, Thorson um, uh, suggests a poem that has the same first line as another poem. Okay, and so um, I cheated because I, I used, uh, April is the coolest month uh, is not the first line of that poem, you know, but you know, it's, it's the famous line. All right, April is the coolest month. We're hoping 30 new poems will arrive. This is an abecedarian. Uh, so the, each word in, con, in, con, uh, in order is, uh, uh, is the alphabet. April's blood curdling damnable expectation for gorgeous Homeric iambics just kills limp noodled me. No old pantoons, casitas, rondos, senryu, tersonels, verse. Well, Xbox, Yu-Gi-Oh, 
Zoloft. All right. Uh, let's see. I read a lot of science fiction poetry and also fantasy and, um, and some horror also. <laughs> and so on April 4th of what year? On April 4th of 20, again, 2013, uh, the prompts were to, to uh, use the name of a spaceship from the, the novels of the science fiction writer, Ian M. Banks. Um, he, had, he had really funny, odd uh, spaceship names. And, uh, and then the, um, the prompt from Brewer was, take the phrase, hold that blank, make that your title and, uh, and write, write your poem. And so this poem used to be called, hold that ship, screw loose. Screw loose was the name of a spaceship from an Ian Banks novel. Um, I've since re retitled it. Uh, Screw Loose was from his novel, The Player of Games. If, if you get the book, there's notes in the back to explain <laughs> all of that stuff. All right. Um, so formerly called Hold That Ship, Screw Loose, and now it's now called Elegy for Ian Banks. Uh, Dan Banks died in 2013, but that same, when I was writing this poem, uh, he was uh, terminally ill with cancer. And um, and I was going to try to send it to him before he passed away, but, but, it, but it, was, it didn't happen. Um, something that inspired me is that William Butler Yeats, when he died, uh, he died in France and Ireland sent a warship to get his body and, uh, so that he could be buried in, uh, in, in, uh, in Ireland. All right. Elegy for Ian Banks. Ian waits at Fourth Courts in Rosyth, where his father had once worked. He sits on a dock, dangling his feet into thick air over dark green water, where once submarines lay for repair, their blunt noses airing in dry dock. The Clipper spaceship Screwloose, from his novel The Player of Games, is on his way to fetch him, to ferry him, to Avalon, Inisafala, Isle of Apples where King Arthur reposes, braced, to save Albion, England, from peril. I, uh, Ian squints into gray, storm-clouded sky, uncertain from which direction Screwloose would appear, swoop in. A three-masted ship gracefully slips into dock. Ian pays not one whit of attention, still scanning the skies. Ian is surprised when the sailing ship's captain strides up, blue plumed tricorn and tasseled epaulets, glistening gold. Mr. Banks, I presume? When will you board, sir? I am master of this vessel to leeward of you. She is screw loose. Jaw slack, Ian doesn't know what to say. He allows himself to be led onto the deck of the clipper ship. Captain McBride gives the order to cast off, weigh anchor. The sun emerges brightly from behind clouds. Standing in the bow, Ian leans into salty spray, the sea scudding and frothing as it breaks on either side of the clipper. Ian feels the cancer somehow fading away, black flakes sloughing off, flurrying away in wind. Ian recalls how he had driven today to the roadside docks in a bit of a frenzy. He'd imagined he would be tardy and need to sprint, yelling out for someone to hold screw loose even as it left, or worse yet, there'd be no spaceship. Hearing a strange metallic noise, like a submarine klaxon dive, dive, Ian turns and looks upward at the sails on the closest mast. Someone in a boat alongside the screw loose would have seen Ian smile as sails harden and shift, drape a translucent metallic canopy over the deck, flare 50s rocket fins. The spaceship screw loose, lifts from the water and streaks smoothly up into air, deep space, the heavens. All right. Let's 
से Oh, here's a, uh, on April 25th, and uh, what was the prompt? April 25th, 2015. Uh, so Thorson asked for the Clary here, uh, which are rhymed uh, little poems that involve, uh, that start with the person's name. And then Brewers was right and across the sea poem. And across the sea made me think of, uh, of, of Herman Melville. For some reason, Moby Dick, and uh, so these are little little funny poems. I hope they're funny. Um, each one begins with uh, with a, with a name, and then rhyme, and then two more lines to rhyme. Uh, Her Herman Melville was into whale kill, so he wrote the famous Moby Dick, although harpooning was not his shtick. Herman Melville couldn't spell well. The real guy's name was Israel but Herman misspelled it as Ishmael. Ishmael is the main character in Moby Dick. Uh, Moby Dick did not, was not a bestseller uh, at that time. It's now considered, of course, one of the great American novels. But uh, during his time, he, uh, he, he published them and, uh, and could, not, could not get rid of them. And he had them stored all over the place. Uh, Herman Melville, didn't sell well. Thousands of Moby Dick copies left over in his attic, his basement, and his mom's were over. Herman Melville fished for bluegill. He said it was almost as fun as whale if you don't consider matters of scale. Herman Melville visited Nashville where Moby Dick didn't get him too far because he couldn't sing or play guitar. I don't even know if Nashville was must have existed at that time, right? I hope so. <laughs> Herman Melville scared a Paris democide. She said, Mon chéri, with you it's wrong. Your Moby Dick is just too long. All right. Somebody give me a date. Oh, what? 23rd, okay. Oh, April 23rd is a, is a again a science fiction poem. Um, the, uh, I, I, I modeled this on a poem by Elizabeth Bishop called 12 o'clock news, which had paragraphs. And then to the side, there was a little phrase that, uh, that so it was, it was a, a fanciful landscape. And then on the side, it would say a desk lamp, right? And then, and then another, I'm making these up. <laughs> then another paragraph, and it would say pencil eraser. <laughs> and so the, the two the two sides were uh, connected in that she was writing this wonderful, uh, you know, strange landscape, but it was really just a desk. Okay. So I'll read the paragraph, and then I'll read the little thing on the side. And you probably can't see it, but this is the actual picture that the, the poem is based on, which is a guitar that I have had since I was, gosh, I must have been 14, maybe. Uh, oh, let me see, my, my note in the back will tell, will tell us. Here. April 23rd, that was from 2012. Thorson's was to write an ecrastic poem, which is a poem based on a, on a work of art, some other, you know, music or, or sculpture or whatever. Um, and the others uh, I already mentioned, um, yeah, I just used those two. And um, there are, let's see, oh no, there, I used three prompts that day because Brewer asked for a morning poem. And then another uh, person that I was following asked for a noisy poem. So, ekphrastic, uh, morning, noisy. Head to the sky. The sun, a ruddy egg poised on the pale wavery horizon rose like a shimmery balloon into a bright robin's egg of cumulus clustered sky. Trees whispered their breezy susurrus into the thin violet haze of early morning. Red burst finish. On the spaceport's wide white concrete, the vast ship stood warming 
It's mirror-like engine housing thrumming and steaming with liquid oxygen. A single chrome fin arced upward like a pointing arm. So all, all based on, on this image. And that's called Whammy Bar. On the side of the spaceship, its massive magenta hull plated with cardinal and amber ceramic armor, the shiny bubbles of the bridge and engine room lit up like angular bars of silver soap, chrome lozenges flashing morning sunlight back to the heavens. Silver foil pickups. The sleek, thin parallel armatures of the faster than light drive stream from the black base of the ship's tail, laddering up to its stiletto nose, high in azure air, pointing like a slim spike, a bright spear set to needle into the bleak vacuum of interstellar space. With the blaring clamor of, that's slinky strings, with the blaring clamor of a thousand thunderstorms, a million Jimi Hendrix feedback howls, his Woodstock star-spangled banner magnified billionfold. The gigantic space arc silhouette, a handmade titan larger than the city, rose like a majestic frigate into the air, poised like a resplendent phoenix on its column of fire, this first vessel of humankind, leaving behind blue earth, this sliver of homo sapiens flinging itself outward into the obsidian brightness of the universe. That's called rock and roll. Um, How about another date? Sixth. Again? The sixth. the sixth? Oh, okay. April 6th. Um, the prompts were Brewer wanted a things not as they appear poem. And Thorson suggested an obad. And the obad is a, is a poetic form of lovers awakening in the morning uh, at daybreak. All right, Obad, it's called. Steve grinned, waking up to see Stephanie's cute face, freckled soft pink lips parted slightly, lace lingerie showing pale throat. Spring morning sun rays, sun, spring morning sun's rays streaming in to light Steph's bobbed hair of ginger fire, her eyes blue, cobalt. Can't believe you're here, he said. She smiled. Then her tongue, black, forked, shot out, her teeth, yellow and crooked, fanged. He screamed, woke up, Steph turning. So that's kind of a horror poem, a fantasy poem. Uh, how about another, uh, another date? The 28th, okay. Um, you know, I don't read this poem anymore. <laughs> now you'll wonder, oh, maybe I'll get you to buy the book. <laughs> How about another day? <laughs> give, me a, give me one other than the 28. 15. 15, okay. All right, 15. The 15th, the prompts were Thorson suggested, write a poem that addresses itself for some aspect of itself, that is, dear poem. And, uh, and Brewer proposed, pick an adjective, make it the title of your poem, then write your poem. So the adjective that I chose was blue, and you'll see all that in the poem. And it originally was titled blue, but then it was retitled um, to clarify what was going on, you know, that I was speaking to a, to a, a poem. And the poem was actually to a, to, to a form that I, uh, that I invented. And so I'm speaking to that, to, that, uh, to that sonnet form in the form of that song, okay? It's called Dear, it's called Prompt, Speak to Your Poem. Dear Hainaku Sonnet, since your birth, you've conquered midnight, morning glory blooms, super typhoons, Two oceans, aquamarine and teal waters, a settling blaze, lighting shattering sky. Sail cerulean air, sweet child, soar. All right. Let me read you the end, and then I'll read some new work. 
Um, so uh, I am a, uh, a fan of The Walking Dead, which is ending now. It's in its in the last third of its final season is coming uh, this fall. And uh, so it's been 11 years, I think. It's been a while. But anyway, um, this is a zombie poem. And uh, it's called All Zombies Coming and Going. And it's what I call a som somersault of abecedarian. It's A to Z on one side, all one word, uh, one word, you know, starting with the alphabet. And then there's a co parallel column in reverse, the same words uh, from Z to A. All zombies coming and going. All very, all very caskets, dooms exhausted. Forever green, horrific inside jujubes, kissing lips, miniature, never oblique. Plan quiet reveries, secure trees, under a visible wound, exit your zipper. Zipper your exit wound. Visible under trees, secure reveries, quiet. Plan oblique, never miniature lips, kissing jujubes, inside horrific green, forever exhausted, dooms caskets, very tall. All right. Um, let's see, I've got some other poems. I have been writing a, uh, a book that's really almost done, I think. No, it's essentially done, but I, I keep thinking, I said that one day yeah, that it was done and then the next day another poem occurred to me. It's a novel in poems. So it's made up of uh, individual poems that, that spell out a uh, story. And the story is about um, th these mythical Philippine monsters, the Aswang, A-S-W-A-N-G. And uh, in my story, there are two Aswangs. Um, the man is a shapeshifter uh, he uh, he can uh, he can change into a uh, a huge black dog, and uh, there there are no so these are Philippine monsters. There are no wolves in the Philippines, so so you have to you have to, uh, the dog will have to do you know essentially he's a werewolf. He's had to turn into a dog, um, and uh, uh, the woman in the couple is a um, is a mananangal which is uh, the, the Filipino word for this monster. Well, the thing about shapeshifters or vampires or ghouls, you know, the, the many, uh, Swang is kind of an all-purpose monster. It has, it has, it takes many shapes, many types of monsters. Uh, but the Mananangal is something that doesn't exist. It, there's no European parallel to, to that monster. Um, it's a woman, the Mananangal is a, um, the word tangal in, in Filipino means to remove or to separate. And so a mananangal is something that separates. And, uh, and it happens to be this creature that separates itself. What happens is this woman, uh, when she wants to become her aswang form, will split at the waist and the top half will uh, grow wings and fly off and do, you know, whatever, whatever terrible things they do at night. Actually, it's really kind of ironic because uh, the Mananangal preys on, uh, on babies and mothers, especially pregnant mothers. So I think that the Mananangal myth must have been originally uh, in, intended, not intended, originally arose as a way to explain, um, to explain miscarriages, I think. The Mananangal has a, a long tongue and it can extend, it can go 10 feet long, maybe further, and it's hollow. And it, um, so that a, a Mananangal can, can, can be outside a pregnant woman's bedroom. It doesn't even have to come in. It can just hover outside in the, in the, of the window, send its tongue in, which then go into her, her pregnant belly and, and uh, suck out the, the fetus. Um, well, that was fun. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. All right, let me read you. Um, the two of them um, get uh, Cl Clara and Santiago are their names, and the two of them um, uh, are 
are threatened by by the, the people around them you know sort of like like the the villagers with with you know with torches and, and pitchforks and Frankenstein right and so so they escape they they uh, they run away go to uh, go go to get married uh, and go uh, and have a child and uh, they move to uh, to San Francisco which is where I'm from and uh, so I wanted to get them there so that I you know, I know I know that place and. So this is after they they escape their area. They're on their way to uh, to, to immigrate to, to the U.S. I, I, it's set in the '30s, in the late '30s, because I wanted it to be a time when it would have been easy for Filipinos to come to the to the U.S. If you had the money, that is. Um, the, the Philippines was part of the U.S. at that time. It was a, a U.S. territory, and uh, and so the Filipinos were. Uh, were uh, American nationals. They weren't citizens. They were nationals, but they could enter, you know, without without too much trouble. All right. So this is Aswang wedding, early Saturday morning. The Aswang lovers held each other's hand, kneeling at the teak wood communion rail of La Iglesia de San Agustin, a simple granite walled Spanish chapel not far from the shores of Manila Bay. Heads lowered. The humble country couple waited while the parish priest, Padre Ray, drowsy, wished he was asleep in his bed. Raising his hand, he droned in, nom in nomine patris et fili, dawn, a faint red, kindled stained glass, the deep dark shade of blood draining from a body torn and shredded. Rings, sign of the cross, yes, but Padre would later tell how his heart sank at the end fangs glinting in the bride's smile, the groom's mouth. So after they get married, they, they take a ship to the US and this is what happens when they arrive. They arrive on March, um, I'm sorry, May 26, 1937, which is the day that, that the uh, Golden Gate Bridge was opened. And I always loved the Golden Gate Bridge and so I wanted to get it into the book. Um, all right. Isn't that simply magnificent, Diago? Clara pointed above the steamship's prow as they sailed under the brand new bridge, its orange towers gleaming at the setting sun. Tiago could only nod, speechless at the beauty of the orange cables shimmering as they swooped in a graceful arc. Thousands of San Franciscans had walked across the Golden Gate that day the grand feat never before possible. Clara and Tiago hurried, but got to the bridge too late, almost dark. The next morning at the dedication, people snickered at the loony old man, the bridge watchman who swore he'd heard leathery wings, walk, walk, and saw silhouetted against the moon, a bizarre flying thing, holding a gigantic dog. Holding a dog? Nearby listeners laughed, pantomiming drinking from a bottle behind the poor man's back, crazy drunk, they whispered to each other, smirking. How beautiful it must have been on top of the 800 foot tower nearest the glistening lights of San Francisco, tiny diamonds strewn on jet black cloth, the bride's wings beating slow and soft, the groom's canine fur shining sable and sleek, holding hand and paw in the velvet night, a thousand stars showering glittery light. They have a son and uh, his name is Malcolm. And um, during World War II, uh, Santiago goes off to war, uh, really not, not because of any, any loyalty to the country, but, but because he was missing killing people. And so this was sort of a way to do it, you know, a swan childhood. Can such innocence kill and kill? Tonight, Malcolm, seven years old, his father at war, caught a bat in his bedroom at bedtime. I was afraid my baby would get bit, but he held it tight. I could see his fur glowing black between his fingers. And I'm almost sure it was screaming. In utter calm, 
with an angelic smile, my boy tore its wings off. Worst, my son's own wings then came out, trembling as the bat died. What future deaths will come, Malcolm? So Malcolm turns out to be a, to be a, uh, um, an aswang as well. Um, and the mother, the, uh, the father uh, dies in the war and the mother trains the, the boy uh, not to show his aswang nature. You know, mostly that probably all their neighbors don't know, you know, that they're, because during the day they look like regular people, right? But uh, they don't know that they're, He's evil monster. Um, just a couple more. This one is called Happy Halloween Surprise. Clara lay in bed recalling Tiago in much happier times. Memories that had her smiling, pranks and little harmless crimes. One Halloween when she was pregnant, the two imagined themselves as parents taking their little one on the streets of San Francisco, trick or treat. Tiago shifted into his canine form as big as a great dame, and out they went, dog and dame, taking a stroll in the moonshine. Laughing children gathered around in costume, petting her lovely hound. Okay, nothing happened there. <laughs> no one got killed. Uh, let's see. Uh, they eventually end up uh, uh, moving back to the Philippines, the mother and son, where um, she becomes a healer, uh, a folk healer, traditional healer, and has, you know, people just lined up outside, you know, for, for, her, uh, for her medical expertise. And um, this is called Malcolm Meets a Black Dog. So Malcolm is a grown-up man. Malcolm meets a black, a black dog. Sitting out in front of the house, late night, trying to read, and this is what, I'm sorry, this is a poem I wrote for April uh, right now, right? So I wrote this on the 17th. Um, so just last week, or not even last week. Malcolm meets a black dog. Sitting out in front of the house, late night, trying to gain some peace, calm, after a long day, helping mama with patience. I suddenly sensed a big black dog right beside me, somewhere nearby, talk, laughter, as the dog sat quietly, large, immense, but not menacing, not a mad dog as I first feared. When I thought of my father, the dog gave me a look, strange and intense, then was gone. I felt in those haunting eyes, my father's presence. This last poem is called Final Flight. And this is um, Clara, who wants to move away from being in a swan. Uh, anyway, it, it's in two parts. There's, this is a, a kind of poem called the haiku, which is a, has a prose part and then a haiku. Uh, then the two parts work you know, uh, together. Uh, they interact with each other. Uh, and so the paragraph is from the voice of Clara and, the, and the, um, the haiku is in the voice of Malcolm. Final flight. The breeze ruffles my long hair, invisible fingers combing. I beat my wings hard and rise into the glorious night, the moon glowing above me like a mother's face lit by a votive candle. As I swoop and glide, the dark land below, rice paddies, mountains afar, and the thousand stars above swivel majestically around this small half woman. I revel in the wind buffeting against my pinions for the last time. There, down, down to the jungle clearing where Malcolm, always faithful son, stands waiting with the bolo. We look at each other and I say, yes. I gingerly lower my torso on my waiting hips. Oh, mother, I strike twice. The wings fall from your back. You stand free at last. Thanks for coming.